Um, yeah, I forgot that this was the 4th of July weekend. So somebody asked me, what are you doing for the 4th? I was like, oh, damn. Today is July the 2nd, huh? So anyway, with this COVID-19 and Corona-20, I didn't really have anything planned. You know, I, I really, man, I want to get out of the country so bad it's just ridiculous. But I see some businesses are acting like business as usual. They just move full steam ahead. Other businesses and parts of the government are taking a step backwards and um, worried about spiking and things of that nature. Then on top of that, this knucklehead called um, 45 is stirring the pot. The Black Lives Matter called it, he called Black Lives Matter racist. Okay. <laughs> Whatever, man. Yeah, it's so bad. So Aquits is just ridiculous. Um, with all of this happening, though, Black Lives Matter is still kind of alive and, and, and doing well. And as a result of that, I expect to see more clandestine acts. You know, more people coming in to do some things. Part of it is fear. Um, fear of a black uprising, fear of the, the have-nots coming together and um, demanding a, a redistribution of wealth, which is what this is really all about. Those that are the richest 1% wanting to hold on to what they have, and on top of that, take more of what they can get than the rest of us. So um, <clears throat> I just expect to see some things. And when I say, talk about clandestine acts, I'll talk about it a little bit more. But um, I'm going to try to keep this short and sweet tonight. Like everybody got somewhere to go for the 4th of July. Um me, I'm just going to hang tight, you know. I'll probably throw some things on the air fryer because I really don't have a place to grill. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about what I call the confusion of COVID-19 and Corona-20. As we moved into deeper into this year, I think the Corona that they saw in 2019 is not the same Corona that we see in today. And as a result of that, I renamed it. COVID-19 was when it started, and Corona-20 is where it is now. So that's where I am with that. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the confusion. I'm going to talk a little bit about the sustainability of Black Lives Matter. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, travel and economics. So without any further ado, tonight's podcast is titled This Normal This New Normal? This new norm ain't normal. And it never will be. Nothing like what we knew before. So COVID nineteen Corona twenty. There seems to be three different types of people right now. One is those people who fear Corona and are staying put. They're acting the same way they act in late March, early April, when we were told to just quarantine and stay home. You know, some of them have shifted to working at home, and as a result, they don't have a a, a need or want a necessity to come out. Others are at the opposite end of the spectrum. They just throw caution to the wind and they act in the like. There was never a corona or COVID-19 or anything to be concerned about. Maybe some of them are conspiracy theorists and think it's all a host with all the people dying. I don't know. And then there are people like myself. We're the type of people um, who venture out after doing... It looks like we're being kind of cavalier, but we really do the research and... Um, we test our boundaries, so we go a little further each time. I like to venture out, but I reserve the right to what I call straddle the fence. When something happens that makes me a little leery, then I'll pull back, you know. Um, 
those who are most fearful of corona are um I think they're the next ones that's going to be at risk. Why? Because they've pretty much, in a lot of ways, shut down. On top of that, I think they worry the most about what's going on. You know, um, in the last couple months, I've lost two brothers I went to high school with that were like brothers. I was, you know, um, good part of how I grew up. You know, with music and what have you. And then I saw my sister um, get ill and have a stroke. And incidentally, I talked to her last night. She's been transferred from the hospital to a uh, um, uh, um, rehab hospital. So she's doing what they're telling her to do, and she's she's doing really well, um, as best as can be expected. But. Of course, I worry. I'm, I worry more about other people than I do myself. Remember, I'm a superhero, so um, you mere mortals have to be concerned with things that I'm not concerned with. But um, those people that are most concerned about Corona, those people that are afraid to come out, those people who are most timid, I think it's dangerous for them. I think that the next ones to be affected because the longer we we deal with this thing over our head, the more it acts on us physically and mentally. Some of the physical we don't we don't see because we're not really going to the doctors. Today I had an appointment with the doctor telemedicine over the phone. Um Phones, computers, so they come in, you, you check with them, you tell them. And this woman asked me what my blood pressure was, you know. So I, I, I gave a number what it usually is. But in the back of my mind, I start worrying. I, not worrying, but I, I just started pondering what is really happening. I, I've never had a problem with my blood pressure, and I'm back in the gym, and incidentally, I'm so damn sore that I can barely brush my hair. But um, I'm doing those things to keep my blood pressure down, to keep my immune system up. So um, with all that in mind, my lab tests, I had some lab tests. I went to the doctor a couple of weeks ago. I had my blood drawn and all of my lab values are fine. Cholesterol was a little high, but, you know, being black in America, the things we eat. I expected that, but I am trending downward. So I say all of that to tell you guys to be on top of it, especially if you're in that first category at the what I call the left end of the spectrum. You, you're you really concerned about this and you're still hunkering down like it was the first week of, of quarantine. Just be advised that it, it, it plays, it wreaks havoc on your body. You know, I'm hearing more and more people having heart attacks and strokes and having problems with blood pressure and what have you. Um, and, it, and it bothers me because I think this has a lot to do with it. it. It certainly can be attributed to some of this. So that's what I'm thinking of. In my humble opinion, I think it takes a toll on our physical bodies, and I know it takes a toll on our mental health and overall mental well-being. So I think those people that are most susceptible to increased blood pressures and possible strokes and heart attacks. So that's all I'm going to say. I said it three times on purpose so people could kind of take heed, you know. Next thing I call this is, is worrisome versus cavalier. Some are worried about every report that comes out and talk about an increase in infection rate or increase in the mortality numbers. And then those other people at the opposite end of the spectrum of what I call the Cavaliers. Those are the ones who behave somewhat like myself, but to the extreme. A lot of times, like I said, my background has been in 41 years of healthcare. I've done everything from different viruses to different bacterial infections, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I make educated decisions based on the information that's out there, and I do a lot of research on my own, you know. That's just the nerd in me. So 
it appears like I just throw caution to the wind, but I make educated decisions. And that's based on who I am. But there are people that are even more cavalier, and I see them when I go out. They act as though nothing can touch them. So if I'm a superhero, what does that make them? They're the ones who boldly test every restriction, and they're the first ones to jump on an airplane, the first one to go into an amusement park, and they're talking, here in Orlando, they're talking about Disney opening up, and there's already full schedules of how many people can go in the park, and their numbers have already just been maxed out. So these are some of the people that I'm talking about. Those in the middle of what I call the cautious ones, we venture out, but we do our research before we expand our horizons. Um, I call it a, a balancing act of sorts. How far do we swim in this shark-infested water called COVID-19, Corona-20? So we are constantly doing things but for me and all I, I, I'll say is myself my spirituality is strong and my faith is even stronger I can't tell you what to do I try to give you information based on some of the research that I've done and sometimes I give you some misinformation hoping that some people will bring it back to me and it's letting me know that people are kind of paying attention and they're not just accepting everything at, at face value because I think that's part of the problem. You need to go out and do some research for yourself because only you can decide what you're comfortable with. Only you can decide when, where, and if you decide to swim, whether you're going to go into the deeper waters or whether you're just going to get your feet wet and, and wade in what I call the shallow side. So enough about that. Black Lives Matter. Um, we're still popular. And I thought it would be, honestly, I, I'm a bit of a realistic skeptic or a skeptical realist. I don't know how to categorize myself. But I see the tide swinging. And I think the only reason we're so popular right now is because this is an election year. And with that being said, I've got a couple of things that I'm working on, and I'll divulge them as they come to fruition, probably in the next couple of weeks or so. So I'm working behind the scenes to do some things. But um, right now, Black Lives Matter is holding persistently. And I hope that it evolves and become as perpetual or as persistent as COVID-19. Uh, Corona 20. So if you hear anybody else start to say Corona 20, remember you heard it here first. Um, I always say I, I know with some of the language that I use, I use some of the what's called buzzwords. So I know I'm being watched by all of these groups, NSA and what have you, and what have you. I want to see this evolve. And I keep talking about in order for it to really be... Um, popular in order for it to be effective we have to consider the judicial and the legislative branches to seek reform in the areas other than police because think of it like law and order on one hand you got the police that handle the suspects but i think more black men and black women die either literally or figuratively in jail because once they go in jail, they're no longer the same. So I think we have to have some accountability and, and oversight when we talk about the, the judicial system and, and um, then have Congress do some things. I don't want to go too much into that. But I think three things have to happen in addition to what they're talking about now. First of all, we have to talk about the police unions. I've read a couple articles where they're talking about the, the chief of police 
fired a couple guys for for either improperly um, behaving or what they thought was an insufficient shoot or what have you. And the police union um, basically overruled them, sent out an arbitrator and got the, the cop his job back. So I think that, that has to be, imagine being the boss of a company and you not having the final word, but you being responsible for that person. So I think the police unions have to kind of be pulled back. Um, the other thing is, I think the police departments have to be accountable to the public. We talk about oversight committees and this kind of thing, and I really don't want to go off on all that entails, but I think what's happening now with some of the young people is really good. When they start to talk about defunding the police, I think one of the things that, that needs to happen is there needs to be uh, somebody on the civilian side that has enough power to make some changes. And um, lastly, I think there has to be a national registry of these cops. Like if you do something, if you kill someone, or if you have so many write-ups, you should be put in the registry just like a, a sex offender so that you can go to a neighboring community or another state and get a job and keep on doing what you're doing. Until there's a financial incentive and them while they're on um, suspension, they should not be paid. So those are three or four things that I, I'd like to see happen. In addition to what's happening now, because this Black Lives Matter thing still has as much steam as it has, I, I see more and more um, stories of what I call clandestine acts of sabotage. Um, we have to be cognizant that a lot of these so-called white supremacists and what have you are wolves in sheep clothing. And by doing so, they can come in and they can kind of sabotage the progression of the movement. Um, when that happens, like the the white girl that burned down the Wendy's in um, Atlanta, when that happens, the protesters get blamed for it. So we, as a community, get blamed for doing some things that we have no control over. So I'd like to see that be pulled back. In addition to that, anytime we try to do something, we always have what I call the house Negro. And that's the one who, who has this crab in the bucket mentality. When they see something happening that they don't either feel a part of or they are envious of, they purposely do things to sabotage it. Um... So they have no ambition and they dare you to, to try to rise up and do something, especially when they see a new leader starting to form and that person starting to get some some headway. So um, I think that's the other thing we have to be cognizant of. It's ironic that these people tend to infiltrate wearing a, a, a uniform of sorts, a black mask and a and black clothing, so they're kind of easy to point out, but not all of them are like that. Some of them are, are quote-unquote within the movement, and for whatever reason, they become disillusioned or whatever, whatever, for whatever reason, they do what they're going to do. I want to take this thing to the next level when I talk about the judicial side. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be turning to some of you guys to, um, if this was my organization, if I was the administrator of, of this group of people, what we would do is we would sit down and we would brainstorm and we would come up with ideas and then we would talk about how how to make these things happen. Are they feasible? How do we make them go from consumption to completion. So I want to start doing some of that. Um, on top of that, I think where we're going, 
We just have to show these young people and let them run because they got so much energy. And they're at the stage of their lives where they have nothing to lose. What's ironic is, and I was talking to a, a, a colleague, a public policy colleague about it. I said, what's ironic about this thing um, is ironic that a lot of the people that are, quote unquote, the establishment now, those people that are in the upper 60s and 70s, those were the, the flower childs and the, the hippies and those people that were protesting the Vietnam War and what have you. Now they've become the establishment. Now, since they have money and status to lose, they're the ones that we have to deal with. Um, and then some of them are second, third generation, money, money. But a lot of them are those people that were once just like the young people. Like when I was young, I was a militant, and I still have some of those radical ideas because I'm at the stage in my life I want to leave this better for my children's children, my grandchildren, and ultimately their children. So once I'm gone, um, I may not be able to leave them a lot of money, but I want to leave them the ability to fish so that they, I want to teach them how to fish so that they can eat for a lifetime. And that's basically what I talk about. Um, tonight, when it dawned on me that this was the 4th of July weekend, I purposely said I was going to make it short and sweet. I don't know who has ideas or, um, about going someplace or plans to go someplace or what have you, but I'm so far away from my family, so I won't be going anyway. Um, what I want to say is I'm, I made this short. I want to keep it short. I want to make it sweet. I want you guys to go out. I want you to be safe. I want you to enjoy your 4th of July weekend. Um, I think I'm going to do probably some steaks. I don't know what you guys got planned, but holler at me. And like I said, let's get together on the flip side. As far as this is concerned, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. I want to thank you guys for continuing to support me. Um, it's so crazy. Last thing I do want to talk about, and I wasn't going to do this, but it just popped in my head. I posted the thing about the, the airplane and the Delta employees. Five of them tested positive and 10 of them died. I want to touch on this simply because um, there's no hard and fast policies or rules in place on how these airlines are supposed to behave. So they're making it up as they go along. Some people say they traveled and the middle seat is empty and other people say the airplane was packed like there was never no corona. So I, I simply say that we do not have the power to tell the companies how to behave, but we do have the economic power of deciding how we're going to spend our money. And if we refuse to travel, they have a financial incentive, which is the only thing that they understand. They'll have a financial incentive to do some things, to make some changes, to make sure that things are safe. But until we do that, as long as their airplanes are full, they could give a flying fall staff and they have no incentive to make changes. But once the numbers start to drop off, and trust me, I want to get out of here so bad, I could smell a Serengeti in my sleep. I could smell New Orleans, and I want, I want to visit my family. I want to get out of the country, but I know it's A, not safe. And I, I think about if I go to visit my sister, if I go to visit my grandkids or what have you, last thing I want to do is me be asymptomatic and bring something to them that ultimately makes them ill. So when we think about it, we have to look at the long game. We have to think of this thing from a st strategic standpoint, and I think that's what's important right now. So I just wanted to touch on that, but I want to cut this short. I want to make it short and sweet because 
I know there's a holiday weekend and some people may have plans. Some people are luckier than I am and they have their family close by. So before I leave you, I want to tell you this. Enjoy your 4th of July weekend. Make it an extended Juneteenth. You understand? I'm not wearing all black. I'm wearing red, black, and green. You understand what I'm saying? 